I am ready. So I welcome everybody. This is the Mastering Your Website 101 webinar for the Instructional Design and Learning SIG. We are in for a treat. Uh, Timothy Esposito, or Tim as we like to call him, is get, going to present Mastering Your Website 101. Um, Tim is I, I can testify to the fact that Tim is actually the WordPress master. If he doesn't know the answer, he will Google it and he will help you out. He's he's uh, helped me out through a, a few pickles uh, that I've had with various websites that I've been running in WordPress. So we're going to hear from the master. I'm going to read from Tim's uh, bio, which is pretty short, and it doesn't nearly uh, have all of your activities. I guess that would have been pages and pages, right, Tim? Uh, I think my next slide has a bunch of stuff. So. Oh, okay. Tim, um, he's an STC fellow. We we watched him become STC fellow at the summit in Denver. And uh, he's has over 18 years of technical communication experience. Um, he's the past president of the STC Philly chapter. Um, before being president, he was vice president, treasurer, webmaster, scholarship master, manager, probably bus driver, and uh, cook and bottle washer, right? Yep, I've worn every hat possible. Every every hat. Uh, Tim has a lovely wife and a cute little son um, who I love to see on Facebook, so check that out. Tim is also um, very involved in STC. You are track manager for the, one, for the summit this year. Which track did you manage, Tim? Uh, tools and technology. Awesome, so uh, yeah, take all of your... I will, I will be moderating a panel at summit, so... I'll come you. to my technology and tools panel. And geek out with Tim. Yeah. All right. So, um, everybody, let's give a nice round of applause for Tim. And I'm going to turn it over and mute myself. Okay. Well, thank you, Vicki. And uh, Vicki's done a good job introducing. Here's a picture of me. And she pretty much, well, listed most of the stuff here. But let's just say that I do a lot of volunteering for SDC. And I've been on several committees and chapter roles and things like that. And uh, most recently, it was I'm on the, the summit committee for this year. Um, I'm also the associate fellow committee chair this year. So <clears throat> I will be at summit. I hope to see you all there and uh, meet you in person if I have not met you yet. So how did I get to this point with website management? So if we travel back in time to the mid to late 90s, I got a job in college working at a local hospital where it was a paid internship, which was few and far between at that point in time, to be their webmaster. So that's where the state of the internet was in 1996. They were hiring college kids to run professional organization websites. This website was updated through Notepad, and then you would FTP the files to a server, and you got to the server by using a dial-up modem on a phone using Prodigy or AOL or something like that to transfer the files. And that's how I got, I cut my teeth on this. And I had made a little sample website on the college website uh, by downloading how to code in HTML, printing it out, and then teaching myself. And that website was nothing but a link of things that I could find again later uh, because we didn't have personal computers back then to store our own bookmarks on. So it was just a list of things to go to, but that got me a job. Uh, from there, I took over the Philadelphia Metro chapter website around 2012, which was newly converted to WordPress. So I read a couple of books on WordPress, which I will mention during this presentation. And then starting in 2015, I took over as the Community Affairs Committee webmaster. Well, took over in that I created it because there was no website for them. But the mission was to uh, promote STC organizations to have their own websites and to create a model website. So I did that with the CIC website, and I've been offering support, as Vicki noted, for, to the various communities in the STC world with their websites. Oh, yeah, I double-checked. They totally redid the hospital website from when I was there. So I cannot show you the beautiful, really bad graphics and stuff that were on there 20-some years ago. Okay, so here's the intended audience. People who are setting up a website for the first time or people who want to learn a little bit more about WordPress and cPanel. And we'll get into what cPanel is in a little bit, but it is a behind the scenes website management application suite that many web hosts have. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. So here are the four main things that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about establishing your domain, hosting the content of that domain, 
creating that content using WordPress, and then managing the website background, which is what cPanel does. Uh, for that, we're going to go into email forwarders, web file management, and database management. So the first item on this list is web domain registration. This is where you define the URL, and I will use the CAC website as an example throughout uh, this presentation. So the URL is just the www.cac.org. You need to pay someone to give you ownership rights of that URL. Um, you, you have to renew this every year, or maybe you buy a three-year package or something like that. But if you do not pay to renew that URL, someone else may claim it, and then you'll have to come up with a new URL. Some sites offer both domain registration and web hosting. Um, some of the more popular ones are GoDaddy, and uh, the one that my chapter uses is Dotster. Um, the web domain registration is usually, you know, somewhere around eight to ten dollars. Just because they offer registration and hosting doesn't mean they're necessarily the best hosting company. So you should shop around to find the best deal that offers you what you need for your website. So <clears throat> once you've registered it, there is invariably a name server setting in your, in your web domain website that you go to. And this is where you fill in the host information that you'll get from the, the server, which we haven't quite gotten to yet, but you have to, this is where you associate the URL with where your files are going to be stored. So you might not have this information yet, but just so you know, you have to declare it on the site where you register the URL to tell it where to find the files in your WordPress site. And you do that on this name service tab, which, you know, most of them have something that looks like this. You just put in the values here. These are the example values that the STC hosting service uses, so that's why they are there. So next up is web hosting. So web hosting is where your files are actually stored. The first part was, what is the name of your website, but where do the files actually live? And that's where web hosting comes in. A2 hosting is the one that STC uses, and I've used it for personal websites that I work with as well. They have some competitive pricing and some good packages and some good support. Um, but keep in mind, do some shopping, go out there and look around and see what there is to offer. Uh, I'm not trying to sell this one. They have not bribed me or anything. I'm just saying that I've worked with them. And this is an, if you look at their site, you can see what you could expect to get on other hosting sites as well. Um, are there any questions on web hosting and choosing your URL? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about WordPress specifically now, and there are two flavors of WordPress. There is a non-hosted WordPress and there is a hosted WordPress. The non-hosted WordPress is free, which is great, but it's very limited. It's not as customizable as the standard WordPress. So I actually have a free WordPress site because it is free. And you can do some customization to the URL. Here's my website. It's got my Twitter handle as the, the first part, but it always ends in .wordpress.com. Um, so this is great if you're just doing a little personal thing or a little blog. You don't need to worry about getting a, a web host or anything like that. You, you just, you know, sign into this wordpress.com and create an account. But what we're really going to be talking about today is a hosted one, which is what we've been leading up to, because most websites that you run into are a hosted website, whether it's for your chapter, your SIG, uh, personal business, uh, you're going to want to use the hosted form because it gives you so much more power and so much more flexibility into what you can deliver content-wise and style-wise to the people visiting your site. So for the rest of this conversation, I'm going to be talking about hosted. Um, but if you just want to create a blog, the not hosted form is a perfectly fine way to do that but we will not really go into that any further. So one thing to set up front is the term PHP. So PHP stands for PHP, Hypertext Processor, which in which case the PHP in that stands for a personal home page. So personal home page, Hypertext Processor is basically what it is. And what does this mean to you? This means that Gone are the days of you creating a .htm or .html file and uploading it to a server and having your website run off of those static HTML files. A PHP file 
is a script file. And what it does is it tells whoever is looking at your site to go and look at a database that's maintained on your site and to generate the website just for them. So if you are familiar with editing websites and you go in and you change some things in an HTML file and then save them and the website updates, that is not how WordPress works. So this is more of a warning that don't expect it to behave in the traditional HTML-based website management. It uses these PHPs, so you're really going to be using an editor that sits on top of those and maintains them. You're not going to be manually editing the PHPs in general. So, so let's say you've created URL and registered it. You've decided on a hosting company. The hosting company says, okay, here's your information. Here's the namespace information, and you've gone ahead and put that into your domain registration site. And now you need to put some content onto your hosting site. And how do you do that? Well, we're talking about WordPress. So they will give you, most likely, an, an access to cPanel. And as I said, cPanel runs uh, sort of behind the scenes on the website and helps you manage it. And one of the things that cPanel may do is include the ability to install WordPress. And you can see here the very first option they have in a package group on cPanel is WordPress. And if you click on that, it'll automatically download and install WordPress on your site and give you a blank page and have you up and ready to go in a matter of minutes. It's very easy. There's also a way that you can go to wordpress.org, download it, FTP it to your site, execute the files there and run it that way. But for most people, it would probably be easier just to go into the cPanel, click on WordPress and have it install it for you. And that is if your hosting company did not already do that for you. I've already seen them come in and just say, okay, here's your website, and they've already done this step for you. But in case they have not, uh, you can install, as you see, many other options here. But the, for our focus today, since this is a WordPress-based presentation, um, you're going to want to choose WordPress. And with that, you have the power to create the website of your dream from 1996. So you guys remember from the dawn of the Internet, you go to someone's web page, this is what it would look like. Uh, we don't do that anymore. <clears throat> so <clears throat> here we are. You are, first thing you do is you're given a WordPress login. So your hosting company should have given you uh, a sign in information to access WordPress. Uh, when you do that, you go to the URL that you created. So here I've got example.com, and then there's a slash, and then there's wp login.php. So there's that PHP that I mentioned a few minutes ago. It's not a .htm, it's a script. So no matter what your website is, if you need to sign in to WordPress, all you have to do is append wp-login.php to your URL, and it'll bring you up this little sign-in screen so you can click and sign in. Um, this is very handy because you may not remember how to get to it, so all you need is that ending onto your URL, and you can always be able to sign in. Some websites, uh, packages that you have, it might say there might be a login link as part of how you've configured WordPress, but some of them don't do that for security purposes, but this URL will always work. <clears throat> so once you've signed into WordPress, the first thing you'll see is a dashboard. This dashboard uh, has a number of options running down the left-hand side that will allow you to create and maintain and customize your website. And I'm going to go through them one by one down the, down the menu on the left, because that makes sense, because that's how things generally work and uh, we'll go through each of them. Now, do I have any questions so far? And the chat is very quiet right now, so no questions okay. from the chat either. Everyone is enraptured with my dictation, I'm sure. We can't wait to find out what is in that left-hand menu. Oh, yeah. The anticipation is killing me as well. Let's find out. So the first thing I want to talk about are posts. Now, WordPress has two types of content uh, by default, uh, the first is posts, and the second is pages, and we'll get to those in a few minutes. Posts act a little bit differently than pages do. So what a post is, a post is something that is timely. So WordPress started as a blogging site, so the idea was you go in, you create a post, and that is immediately the first thing people see on your website is the most recent post. So that way, whoever is following your blog can see your latest updates. So that's what a post is. This is for something that is a like an announcement. 
It is not a how to contact us page. Uh, it is here's what we're doing this week, or here's the latest updates from us. And the idea is this will slide off the page as new posts are made. So <clears throat> you can use something on post called categories. And you can see in the picture here, we have here announcements, leadership resources, and webinars. And what you're able to do with posts are you can create feeds on your website. So when people click on a certain link, all of the things in these categories will appear in the order in which they're posted. Um, this is slightly different from tags. Tags, you put in similar, you know, you might tag things for uh, travel, let's say. And if you click on travel tag on any posts, it'll show all the posts that have been tagged with travel, or maybe Europe or, you know, whatever you want. Whereas the categories are more like, like I have here, announcements. Okay, I wanna see all of the announcements that you're making or I wanna see all of your blog posts, or I wanna see all of the events that you've got scheduled. Um, they, they work similarly, but slightly differently. So tags are sort of, uh, uh, it's just a way to group things further, more, more, more granularly. Uh, so that's the concept behind posts. They're temporary, you put them in a category so you can have them in a feed, and you can tag them so you can see similarly grouped or similarly tagged posts across the categories. Now, WordPress has uh, a new editing system. This is featuring the classic one for the most part, but it's a WYSIWYG editor. Uh, the new one is as well, but they use blocks instead of a, a Microsoft Word style thing. So these are, uh, I, I've uh, commandeered Ben a bit, Ben Welk, whose picture is center here. He, he features prominently in here because he was all over the CAC website when I created this. And plus he's a nice guy and let me do that. So you'll see, you'll be seeing a lot of Ben through this presentation, a little bit of Sarah here as well. Um, <clears throat> so when you're editing a post, it gives you a WYSIWYG format. So you can type in your words, you can format them, you can make them headings, and you can also click on this little text box in the corner and that'll let you edit the HTML. And I'll get more into that in a little bit later. And here on the right, you can see the categories uh, that you might associate this particular post with. And then when you're done, you can publish it. And in the upper right, you see uh, the, the history of whether it's been published, whether it's a public item or not. And if you need to make an update or trash it, those options are there as well. In the bottom right, you can see tags. And so if you want to tag things, that is present also. Now similar, to posts are pages, and these are conceptually different in that pages are static. So if you look here, you can see, here we have a page for the Community Achievement Award, the Community Pay Center Award, a calendar about the CAC. These are all things that will be static on your website. They do not, they're not timely. They are, they are there, and they're the framework, the skeleton of how the website is structured. Those pages may contain posts on them, or they may not. So let's see what we have here, boom. This is an example of how to edit a page, and it looks very similar to the posts, uh, but it doesn't have the same categories on the right-hand side. What we have there are page attributes, such as parent, and what that does is, if I pop back, it builds a hierarchy. So if you look at the re leadership resources about halfway down, you'll see there are four items that are indented below that. So what that means is each of those pages are a sub page in the hierarchy from the leadership resource. This helps you organize your content and you can make your menus follow suit so readers of your website can follow and find that content easily as well. And when you say it here, so here's the Community Achievement Award one, here is leadership resources as the parent. So that this is showing that this is a child item to the to uh, leadership resources. So some of the resources for leadership are community achievement award information. Otherwise, this is pretty much the same. You can edit things, you can update things, you can publish them, delete them, uh, just like in the post. It's the same style editor. Now I alluded to this before, but there is a text option. So if you click the text button, which is this little tab up here in the upper right of the screen, it shows you an approximation of the HTML that is driving this page. Now again, everything is actually a PHP, it's not HTML, but 
this will let you see what kind of coding is going behind the scenes to make that WYSIWYG look the way that it does. And it might also have some hidden items in there. So if you look, there's a script tag here at the top. So this is something that was put in for Google Analytics. You do not see that on this page because it's in that script tag. It is not actually text that people will see on the website, but it is lurking in the background doing something on this site. Um, sometimes the WYSIWYG editor gets stuck on things. Why is this style perpetuating? I don't want that. Why does it keep italicizing this? If you drop into this mode, uh, you can see all of the tags and you can clean things up manually uh, if things are not working out for you. And this is an option both on posts and on pages. So if you are a little bit comfortable with HTML, you have the option of coming in here and doing things. If you don't want to worry about HTML, good news is you don't usually have to click on that text tab to see anything. Next up, we'll talk about media, because if the websites were all just words, it would be really boring. People like to break it up with pictures or do attachments and PDFs and PowerPoints and other things embedded on the site. So <clears throat> there is an option on the menu for the media library. And when you go there, you can manage all of the media items that you've posted on the website in the past, in addition to adding new media. So here's a snapshot of the CAC website from a couple years ago. You can see headshots of all the people that have done stuff on the CAC website. In addition to various files, you'll see some docs and some PowerPoints and some PDFs in there. So <clears throat> when you want to create media, you can go ahead and add media and you will navigate to where that file is. And boom, here's that picture of Ben that I was alluding to. It gives it a file name. There is a URL for it that is where it is being stored on your web server. You can give it a title, you can give it a caption. The captions are neat because if you insert that picture somewhere else, it automatically brings that caption in. There's alt text that you can put in, so that way if there's a screen reader and the person can't see the picture, you can put in text that describes what the picture is looking at. And here's the description. This is so if someone else is browsing through your media library and they're not sure what this picture is about or what it was used for, you can put in a description. So here, here's what we use for a byline. So if Ben ever does another presentation, we can just say, oh, here's a picture of Ben. This is what we use for the byline. It's the right size. And at the bottom, it shows you some of the, the posts that it has been used in before. So you can go to that post and see how it looks there. When you want to insert one that's already there, so that was uploading it to the media library. So we've already added the media. So now you want to take that media and put it into your post or your page. You click the insert media button and it brings you up this picture of your media library. And here's something that I've since corrected, but if you do it too many times, you end up with five Sarahs and six Bens. And you don't want to do that. So here's where you want to make sure you manage your media so you only have one picture of each person. So you know they're not taking up your disk space and you're not misusing maybe one is not as good as the other. So point here is manage things. But <clears throat> if you're just creating a page and you've already uploaded a picture, you click the add media button and it shows you your pictures. Um, or your PDFs or whatever, you check off the one you want and it defaults in all that text that was there from when you added the picture originally. The title, the caption, the alt text, all that defaults in. Do you want it centered? Do you want it to link to something? What size do you want it to be? All that stuff is there and you can customize it for this instance. If you want the alt text to say something different, go ahead and change it here. Because then when you paste it in here, boom, there's that caption that I talked about. It comes in underneath the Ben's picture. And you can further edit things. You know, here we are centering it. That's what that little icon is that's floating over his head. I'm clicking the center button to uh, get the picture to float in the center of the page. So if you do all that maintenance work ahead of time, when you actually go to insert the image, it should be pretty easy because it'll come in with the default information that you gave it originally. And you, in theory, probably do not have to edit it again. Granted, I wouldn't leave this caption up there for Ben, but I thought it was fun for this particular example. You can then drill into the picture in case you don't have enough options. Change the caption, change the alt text, change the size. What do you want it to link to? You can have it linked to a specific picture. You can go to another page. You can go to uh, an attachment so it'll download it or you can have it do nothing. So 
you set up the defaults when you create the media on your site, you can customize it when you bring it in, and then after it's there, you can still drill into the picture and change how it looks and works. So there was a lot of flexibility there. Next up, we're going to talk about appearance. Appearance is how WordPress, not how WordPress looks, but how the output of WordPress looks on your site for your end users. So <clears throat> the first thing we'll talk about here are themes. Themes are something that you can get for free or you can pay money. In my experience, the good ones cost money. Um, WordPress itself offers free ones, uh, usually named after the year, and they're sort of a blogish template. Uh, you can download them and use them as you see fit. And what that does is it controls the layout of your final website. So when people go to your site, is there a big picture at the top? Is there a small picture? Even just looking at these two samples here, the one on the left implies that there will be a giant picture at the top of your website with text below it. Whereas the one on the, in the center is a, a smaller picture with a different style menu and then the posts appearing below that. So you should shop around uh, when picking out themes and you can apply them and usually there's not too much trouble to switch between them. But this is where you, you wanna look and feel that is of your end website and that is what themes control. So once you've selected a theme, there are ways that you can customize it. So here I am adjusting the Community Affairs Committee and we're using the active theme of 2017. And you can see all these options down the left hand side. You can, for example, control what how your home page works. So by default, since WordPress was a blogging website, they assume that you are setting up a blog. And a blog has posts which are timely, so they will be replaced by the next newest post as they are posted. So therefore, it sets by default that your home page displays your latest posts, not a static page. So you have the option here of customizing your home page. Do you want it to just be a blog site? So whatever your last post is, that's at the top, or do you want it to be a static welcome page? That's you can define this here in the settings for your theme. You can also put in, you know, the stuff that you would expect a website to have, the title for it, the tagline that may appear, um, the little icon that appears in the corner. So here we have an SCC icon. So that way when you're looking at a tab, what does the little icon look like? You can load that into here as well. All of that is customizable in this configuration of the appearance. The next concept for customization is widgets. Widgets uh, are standard with WordPress. Some themes may add new widgets to them. And widgets let you further customize the layout of your website. So if you look in this picture here, there it says blog sidebar, footer two, footer one, and maybe footer two or three or something underneath of this pop-up. So what you can do is these, these are defined by the theme as places where you can place content that are outside of the main page or the main post. So think of it as a secondary column on your website where you might have a little calendar or a list of links or a menu or you know whatever you want. So widgets let you add content to that area. You might put something in the footer, such as what I have here, a copyright date. So that way that always appears at the bottom of every page. You can, the way this works is, you would take from the available widgets on the left side, you would just drag and drop those into the various sidebars on the right hand side. And then once they're there, you'll customize them. So in this example, you'll see there's search, custom HTML, recent posts, archives, categories, meta, and then looks like a footer with a copyright information in it. So when you go to the website, you'll expect to see search, connect with us, recent posts, all that's running down this column on the right hand side. And that is entirely controlled by this search, custom HTML, recent posts, archives, etc. So if you don't like how it looks, maybe you don't want the search bar at the top, you want it the second one down, you literally just drag and drop this and then it's immediately reflected here. And over here, you can see posts. Here's that picture of Ben peeking up over the wall saying hello. Widgets can be very powerful because some of them allow you to do HTML. There's a custom HTML one. You can do whatever coding you want. You can call 
pictures from other websites. You can design your own structure for things. It's pretty much limitless, although you are you know, confined to a small little corner of your website. So you're not gonna wanna pull in something really big, but you can make custom whatever you want. In this example, we've got to connect with us. And this is something that Vicky and I put on the website several years ago. Uh, these are social media buttons that you could click on on the CAC site. We downloaded those images and uh, created links behind each of them to customize them. That's right. We built that with our own two hands there. Yeah. HTML. That was actually Vicky's idea. Nice. Um, and that is a custom HTML widget, uh, which you can see here, custom HTML, connect with us. Since then, the theme updated and they had their own uh, little icon. So I, I ended up switching to that eventually. But uh, originally, it wasn't available to us. So that was something we made from scratch. And it was pretty awesome. <clears throat> so next up, we've got menus. Menus are how people navigate on your website. Uh, they're usually uh, a line of words across the top. You know, everyone's seen these menus. Uh, you click on them and it takes you to another page or you click on them and it pops down some options and you choose that option. The bigger your site, the more options you have. The menu structure is entirely up to you. I tend to make it mirror the hierarchy structure of the files in the pages of, of the website. So that way it's a one to one. But you can do it however you want. In fact, some themes let you have multiple menus. So you can have a menu on the side that goes to some things. You can have a menu on the top that goes to something else. When you create a menu, you can drag um, either a page or a category over or do a custom link. So a custom link just says go to some URL. A page one says go to a specific page that you've created. So this one is about the CAC and it's going to the topic about the CAC. And that's how it appears in the menu. Further down, um, we have a category one for best practices. And I'll get into that next. So that is really the concept of a feed. So, and this touches on what I mentioned earlier, if we travel back in time 20 minutes, to when I started out and I was talking about posts. So posts can be tied to categories. And a feed is basically just taking all the things in a given category and displaying it. So um, what we have here is uh, an example. Let's see. The example would be events. So you've created a number of posts and you've added to them the category of event. You can create a feed and put it on your menu and call it events. And instead of manually updating a page every time you have a new event, you can just say, okay, show all of the posts that are of the type of event. So that way when people click on your menu and they say, oh, events, they click on events, it automatically fills in everything on the page with any posts that have been categorized as events. This is very handy because otherwise you could do an announcement for an event, but then you forget to go and update the page for events, so that's outdated. This is a one-stop shop. You say, okay, I'm announcing an event. The category is event. I've got a feed for events. If people click on the events feed, boom, it's there. Um, <coughs> so that's a very powerful thing. And you can see down here, I've got a feed for best practices uh, in this screenshot. So that is taking in a category. So any posts that have been categorized as best practices will appear in that particular feed under the leadership resources option in the menu. Now what you can also do to a post is you can make it sticky. When you make it sticky, it sticks to the top of any particular feed. So what the Philadelphia chapter does is they have their home page set up to have a feed on the, the main page, but they wanted some static text to always be there. So we created one post, made it sticky, and that's where we put the welcome to the Philadelphia chapter. Here's the calendar of events. Here's some other information to welcome you. And then immediately below that, that's where the actual feed begins. And you can see all the most recent posts after that. So feeds are something that are potentially very powerful and very dynamic. Um, so it's something that you should consider doing if you have a lot of transactional posting on your website that you need to group logically. Next up in WordPress land are plugins. Plugins are things that are available for free or for purchase, and they control how your website functions. So we have here in this example, a cache, which can make your website work faster 
Although in my experience, they just kind of mess it up. So I think you shouldn't run those. Um, here's one that says duplicate post. You want to just copy the existing post. It, when you have this plugin installed, it adds a button to any given post that says make a copy of this. So you can use it as a template. Um, here's, here's one for the image optimizer, next gen gallery. This enhances how the media system would work. And then there's a word fed security. Uh, and I get more into this into my, uh, my website's 201 website class. Um, WordFed Security is a free security app that will help screen out potential hacks on your website and make sure everything is updated and find problems with it. And I have a few more, but like I said, that is for the 201 website class. Uh, so the idea here is plugins are things that you can get from the internet. You only want to install things that are verified to be useful and good and not going to rip off your site. Some of them are free. Some of them cost money, some of them are free, but you can upgrade them so they work even better once you pay money. Uh, so you need to sort of shop around and see what it is you want to do on your website. And you are under no obligation to install any of these. In fact, I highly recommend not having extra plugins just stuck in there for the sake of them. If you're not using them and they're not useful, remove them completely because they could potentially be a security breach. What if you have one that's out there and it's really, really old and the owner has abandoned it? That could be a potential security flaw that could enable some bad people to hack into your website through that outdated plugin. So be picky and choosy about what plugins you use to customize how your website works and always be on top of maintaining them and updating them to prevent security problems. Next up, who is using your site? And I don't mean the people that just view it. I mean who are collaborating on the site with you. There are several different layers of collaboration available to people that sign into your website. So when you sign into a site, you are given a certain level of power as designated by the person who allows you to sign into the site. The highest one is the administrator, which makes sense because they are the admin for the site. They can control anything and everything. The next highest is the editor. The editor can publish posts and manage the posts of other people. What they can't do is create new users and tweak the website like that, but what they do is they're the overlord for all of the content coming to the site. They can approve everything and publish them and edit them. Next up is the author. That's someone who might write articles for your site. Uh, they can publish their own articles or their posts in this case, but they can't edit anyone else's stuff. It's just their own work. And then there's a contributor, which is the, the new person who's helping you out with the site, but you want to double check it. They can add all the content they want, but it doesn't go live on the site until an editor or an admin has approved it. Last up is a subscriber. If you have people just signing into your site to sign in for stuff, maybe to add comments or something like that, um, that's what a subscriber is. They can't create any content. All you're doing is authorizing them to make posts like, like uh, I really like this kind of comment or that kind of feedback on posts and pages. When you create one, you need to give it a username. The usernames are uh, individual. You can't change them. You can't have duplicates. You can put in a name, uh, a nickname, and then you can put in display name publicly as. And this is pretty cool. So let's say you have several contributors and you don't want them to have bylines or they don't want to be publicly recognized on this. You can have their name display as a nickname instead of their actual name. This is also a good idea because if you're signed in as an admin, you don't want to give away your admin's username so people uh, might try and hack into your site with that. So this way you can have the names added to the posts and the pages be slightly different from what they sign in as. So in this example is my name. I've got a nickname of STC PMC, which is my chapter website. So whenever I would post on my chapter website, instead of having the article attributed to me, it's attributed just to STC PMC. Uh, last, we have settings. There are a ton of settings, and this is all low-level configuration. This is something you might want to look into when you first create the site, set up some defaults, and then you probably do not need to worry about this again. Um, I, there are many options here, and I do not have time to go into what they all are, 
but just know that there is a settings option that you can go through uh, to configure some of the, the basic functionality of the site. In the screenshot here, when you create a new user, it defaults to subscriber. If you want them to just default to author, that's fine. Uh, do you want to change the site address, uh, the tagline? You can change it here as well. There are a lot of options buried under general and writing and editing and reading and how, how do you think want things displayed or editing tools. All of that is buried down here relatively low level and it has a decent set of defaults. So the odds are you probably don't need to mess around with it very much. Um, the one thing that I do like to change is the media setting because it defaults to be placed in, when you add a picture, it defaults to be placed in a folder tied to the date that you added the image. Uh, I find that awkward because if I want to go back and find that file later, I don't, I don't want to have to remember what year and month I added the file. Uh, so I usually default that just to be a general media folder where everything lives together. But that's my personal preference. So that's it for WordPress. I'm going to go to cPanel now. Do we have any questions or uh, comments on the WordPress basics? I have a question. On the page that you were just talking about when you went over the WordPress information, um, we use a staging site. So would that be what we would put in here um, if we wanted our people to only be editing from the staging site? I don't know. I have not set up a staging site before. Uh, so that is out of my realm of experience, unfortunately. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I haven't worked with that yet, so, uh, so I apologize. I found no a problem. gap in my knowledge. I am no longer the master that Vicki uh, swore oh, that I was. 25. Yes, you are. Of course you are. And um, Jeff Jeffrey Brown has a question. Um, he wanted to know what the approximate monthly cost of WordPress is. It's free. WordPress is free. What you're paying for is annually you have to pay to renew your domain registration, your URL, and then probably monthly or biannually or something like that, you have to pay for your hosting company. So most of it will be, you know, like $8 a month or something like that. But WordPress itself is free. And also, Jamie thought that the um, alt text for Ben's picture was very clever. Uh, thank you, Jamie. I figured since I was using his face throughout the entire presentation, I should put something lighthearted and fun in there for him. He's a good sport. Yes. He was, he's like, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> and he was fine with it. Okay, so I'm going to move into cPanel, which I mentioned briefly earlier. cPanel is something that may be offered by your hosting company. It is a very, very popular behind-the-scenes management tool for websites. Not every hosting company uses this, and they might not all be using the same version of it. But in my experience, this seems to be almost the default one for most hosting companies. And it gives you this plethora of options. And I have everything collapsed here. So these are all the categories that cPanel gives you. And if I were to click on any of those little pluses there, it would give you anywhere from you know five to two dozen options under each of those sections. And in today's webinar, I do not have time to go through every single thing. We could be here for a week talking about what all these options are. So I'm just going to highlight on some of them. Your hosting service will give you a password and a login for cPanel, and they'll give you the URL for it too. This is stuff that you should not lose. They'll send it to you in an email saying, here's your cPanel sign in, here's your username, here's your password. You go to that site and you put in your password and then you're brought to that menu that I showed previously. Now, one feature that a lot of organizations use is email forwarding. So unless you have already, unless you want to manage all of your email addresses through cPanel, what a lot of people do is they create forwarders. So you might have a Gmail account, but you want people to be able to reach you at a, an email address which matches the website URL that you're on. So it looks a little bit more professional. Because it's always a little disconcerting when you, you go to some website and just, oh, you know, something or other .com, reach us at AOL.com. Uh, that seems a, you know, a little bit professional disconnect, like they didn't brand themselves 100% behind the website. So what the email forwarders do is they allow you to create mock emails, email addresses that 
match whatever your URL is. So the domain that I'm using this example for is the CAC website, which is cac-sdc.org. So if what I'm creating here is address to forward example at cac-sdc.org, and if someone were to send an email to that address, it would instead forward to example at gmail.com. So I would sign into that Gmail account and get anything that was sent to example at cac-sdc.org. Um, this is great because you can have, you can create as many forwarders as you want and you can have the same forwarder point to multiple email addresses. So maybe you have some volunteers on your website, but you, you don't trust them yet. They're new. You want to monitor what they're in charge of. So you say, okay, um, you're going to be, uh, newsletters at mywebsite.com. So whenever newsletters at mywebsite.com gets a message, it will go to that volunteer you can create another forwarder that also goes to your email so you can make sure that you're that they are not missing any of the messages that are being sent to them and that they're addressing everything uh, this is really handy for SEC chapters because inevitably the chapter leaders may change and the email addresses may change but this way you can say president at stcpmc.org and whoever the president is this email address will get to them because you can just change the forwarder to go to whoever's email address comes in very powerful, very handy, very easy to manage. Now, something for the more nuts and bolts of your website, you want to do a backup. There are plugins which will allow you to do free backups, and I get into that in the 201 website class, but cPanel gives you the option to back up your website, and this is something you should do monthly, uh, just so you don't lose any of your content if something happens to the server. You go to the backup page, and you just click, you know, back all this up and it creates little backups and saves them and you get sent the files if your website goes down you can come back in here and upload those files to restore your website i would recommend creating a calendar entry you know on the last day of the month the first day of the month do a backup it's really easy you just come here click a few buttons and you're done in a few minutes it doesn't take very much time or like i said some of the security uh, apps that i or plugins that i recommend in my 201 class they will automatically generate a backup for you and send it to you and there are paid ones that do that too although i recommend the free ones so here's a quick task list for anyone that's looking to manage their own website pick a theme that works for your site uh, be choosy about this because, like I said, there are free ones out there, and some of the free ones are really nice, and some of them are really not that nice. Uh, when you get a theme, make sure it is still maintained by whoever created it, and whenever they offer an update, take the update because people have had their websites hacked if they have outdated information on it, and a theme could be a backdoor place to assault your website. Likewise, WordPress updates itself uh, every other month or so. If you get a notification that a new version of WordPress is updated, go in, first of all, back up your site, as I just discussed, and then go ahead and install the new version of WordPress. When that happens, there's a button that says, do you want to update WordPress right now? And you say yes. And it says, okay, updating WordPress. And then two minutes later, it says WordPress is updated. Very easy to do. You don't need to download anything. You don't need to load the files anywhere. It's just a button that you push. Same with plugins. Um, You'll get a notice, it, well, if you, if you install some of the security apps that I recommend later, um, it'll say, oh, this is outdated. Make sure you update it. You can just go into the plugins page and say, oh, show me all the ones that need to be updated. Go ahead and update them. And again, that's something you want to do fairly regularly to prevent security risks and to make sure that the plugins still work right with the new version of WordPress that was installed. Uh, as noted earlier, back up the website at least monthly. You want to maintain your user access. You have a volunteer who's helping you and they're really great, but then they moved somewhere else and they're not helping anymore. You might want to, you know, strip their access because maybe they've got a bad password and someone hacks in using their account and they take over your site. So if someone's not an active user, go ahead and get rid of them um, or at least knock down their privileges so they're just subscribers or something so they can't ruin the site even if they do get in that way. Uh, using cPanel, maintain your email forwarders so that way your messages do not get lost. Uh, oh, one of the benefits of an email forwarder is your personal email address is not listed on the website, just the forwarder. So if someone starts hammering your forwarder with lots of junk emails, you can change that forwarder uh, so it doesn't go to your, to your personal email anymore. 
uh, personal pet peeve of mine, update the copyright date on the bottom of your website. There's nothing like, oh, here's our up-to-date website, copyright 2015. That makes it sound like you haven't changed anything since 2015. Spend a moment to go in and update it to be the current year. Uh, maintain your domain registration and maintain your, uh, <coughs> your, your web hosting as well. The domain registration is very important because if you have your URL and you love it and you forget to pay for it one year, someone else may buy it and then want you to pay them hundreds of dollars to get it back or it's just not available and you need to come up with a brand new URL. And I know at least one SEC community where that's happened and they had to come up with a whole new URL for themselves. So keep on top of that and register it regularly. Uh, groom your media library so there's no, you know, there's not 10 pictures of Ben and Sarah all throughout it. Um, uh, you know, an organized library is a happy library and it makes it easier to use for everyone. When you're using posts, make sure they are clearly used so the feeds work. Make sure you categorize them correctly. If you have an event and you don't put it in the category of event, it won't show up on your event feed so people might not see it. Just make sure you follow through on all of that stuff consistently. So Tim, Eliza wants us to know that she once moved a site uh, without backing it up and she lost a lot of content. Yeah, always it's a do a backup. It's a very sad story. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. Always do a backup. So here's a little ad for Mastering Your Website 201, which I may be doing with the CAC in the next year or so. Um, here's what we talk about in that. There's more details on customization. Um, how to connect your site more directly with social media, uh, more details on plugin management and some security plugins that I would recommend that you try, and they're all free. How to use HTTPS uh, to make sure that your site is secured. Uh, I go into some more details on cPanel, such as the antivirus tool that's in there and the file manager. I talk about how to set up FTP so you can easily upload and download files directly to your web host server. I talk about installing an SEO, which is a search engine optimization, which helps, for example, Google find the content on your site and index it so other people can find it as well. I go into details on how to create an event calendar so uh, you can easily update that and have all of your events published on your site uh, in calendar format. I talk about how to create a, a subscribe list in their widgets, so if you have a, an email newsletter, people can easily click on that to sign up. And I also talk about, if you really want to get into it, Google Analytics, which will allow you to see how many people from Turkey are looking at your website every night. Some books that I would highly recommend, uh, WordPress for Dummies. It may be a dummies book, but it is really good, and they do a great job simplifying the complex and going into so much detail on how to set up your website. Um, it is a tremendous resource and I highly recommend it. Almost as good as WordPress, The Missing Manual. Uh, that one is very good too. I think the Dummies book is a little bit more complete, but they're both really good resources. And if you want to learn more about those email forwarders, this is a link that to an article that I wrote a few years ago on the CAC website on how to customize your chapter email addresses. It goes into uh, more information on the email forwarders. These are some people. Hey, look, there's Jamie. She's on this call. Uh, who helped me with this website uh, presentation when I set it up a few years ago. They all gave me feedback and suggestions. I just wanted to call out a big thanks for Ben, especially in this floating head. And if you'd like to contact me after this, uh, here's my email address. If you want to stalk me on Twitter, or go to my personal website, which I set up a few years ago when I ran for society treasurer. It didn't work. Um, that's there. And uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, also, I made the slate for SDC uh, secretary this year. So if you're an SDC member, feel free to vote for me in the upcoming election next year if you want to deal with me some more. And that's all I have for you today. More questions. I have a question, and that is, when did you say you're going to do 201? <laughs> I'm ready to sign up now. Uh, that's that's Vicky's job. Um, Vicky, do you want to do a 201? Absolutely. Marilee, okay. when do you want? Do you want it sooner or later, Marilee? Or who was Next it? Next week. <laughs> <laughs> 
Next week is Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah. Okay, two weeks from now. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I can use this information right now. I'm just, just no leaving pressure. after the holidays. Um, <laughs> I've got the associate fellow grading to do by the middle of December, so I'd, I'd prefer to do it after that. Okay. <laughs> but sooner rather than later well, would be great. <laughs> and now that we have Tim's contact information, we have uh, – now a great resource now you have the same great resource that i had so tim i wanted to ask if you'll share your slides with me so that i can share them with the uh oh, yeah, of course. Um, I'll, I'll email it, email it to you uh, as soon as the call ends vicky that sounds awesome well let's see okay Ke yeah kelly uh, smith also says when is the 201 class so everybody is on board for the 201 we should have sold tickets but it's part of uh, one of the benefits of our SIG membership that we get to attend these for free. So thank you. Does anybody thank have? Thank you, Tim. Does What's anybody... that? I said thank you, Tim, very much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Anything I can do to help? Clapping. Yay. Yeah, we'll have a round of applause here. Marcy says, good job. Yes, thank you. This was great. Uh, very pleasant presentation. Very, oh, well, okay. very well done, Phil says. Yeah. Yeah, so I apologize. I'm slightly congested with a cold, so my voice is not as clear as it may have been normally. Oh. Uh, Jeffrey Brown says, great info today. Emma says, thank you. Great info. Thanks, Tim, from Jamie. 